In this episode of Quakers Today, we ask, outside of Quaker worship, where do Quakers seek inspiration, spirituality, and community? Carl Blumenthal talks about Quakers, spirituality, and mental illness. I will share with you a new book about the Black American theologian and mystic Howard Thurman. And two Quakers consider each other's spiritual influences. One is inspired by ancient and modern paganism, and the other by the charismatic church. I am Peter Santoscano. This is Season 2, Episode 5 of Quakers Today Podcast, a project of Friends Publishing Corporation. This season of Quakers Today is sponsored by the American Friends Service Committee. Okay, so my name is Carl Blumenthal. Uh, I live uh, in West Flatbush, Brooklyn, New York, and I attend Brooklyn Monthly Meeting. Uh, I had been an urban health planner for like 25 years and decided it was time for me to give back to the community that I hadn't acknowledged as being part of, which is people living with mental health conditions. I became what's called a peer counselor. That's what I've been doing for the last 20 years or so. During the pandemic, when I was working for NYC Well, it's the city's um, mental health hotline, crisis line, I had many encounters of, of a spiritual kind. It's amazing how deeply you can connect with people over the phone or even through chats and texting. You're recognizing that of God in everyone. The reason I'm interested in the connection between Quakers and mental health is that George Fox himself, I think, was going through, an you might call it an existential crisis, you might call it a severe depression when he found himself on Pendle Hill and, and discovered or rediscovered Christ and realized that Jesus spoke to his condition. <laughs> as, as a result, he went on to heal a lot of people, I think, both psychologically as well as spiritually. Lately, in the last few years, I've had more what I would call, quote-unquote, spiritual experiences. They're hard sometimes to separate them from psychological ones. As I mentioned before, the fact that I have mental illness, bipolar disorder, you can be very high or very low, especially on the times when I'm very high. That's when I feel more in touch with the universe. (laughs) There's probably a, a history of creative people who've also had mental health conditions particularly those who've had bipolar disorder. I feel like I'm in that tradition. (laughs) I guess you could say I'm a descendant of George Fox in that way. (laughs) I'm sure on Pendle Hill he was pretty high. (laughs) That was Carl Blumenthal in an excerpt from the Quaker Speak video entitled Quakers, Spirituality, and Mental Health. You will find this Quaker Speak video and the Quaker Speak channel on YouTube or visit Quakerspeak.com. Two recent articles from Friends Journal jumped out at me. Andy Stanton Henry's All the Way Back to George Fox Experimenting with Charismatic Quakerism and If Quakers Were Also Witches by Sarah Walcott. Andy is not charismatic or Pentecostal, You will hear the two terms being used almost interchangeably in this conversation. Sarah is not a pagan, but Sarah has experienced and appreciates charismatic worship. For Andy, though, as an evangelical friend, witchcraft and paganism are not only taboo, they're forbidden. Yet, as I read their articles, I heard a common theme emerge a message for Quakers and seekers to go deeper and maybe even reclaim something that has been lost. I asked Sarah and Andy to read each other's articles. They then spoke to me individually, then to each other. Regardless of your feelings or beliefs about charismatics and Pentecostalism or pagans and witchcraft, I invite you to listen with the same openness and curiosity that both Sarah and Andy brought to the conversation. You don't have to give up anything about your identity to listen to somebody else. Sometimes our failure to dialogue is an expression of our spiritual insecurity. It's so easy in our world to be caught up in a particular way of listening. I 
have a confession to make. Every Easter, you will find me worshiping in a megachurch. Now, what's a good Quaker boy doing in the middle of a charismatic megachurch? I'm there because my parents like to attend the church on holidays, and I want to join them. But I'm also there because the worship is a refreshing change of pace from my usual experience in Quaker meetings. I was surprised when one of my Quaker elders told me that for much of the world, Pendle Hill was far more closely associated with witches in the 1612 witch hunts shortly before Fox's birth than with Quakerism. Pendle Hill is a popular spot for local ghost tours. It was featured in Doctor Who. And the 400-year anniversary of the Pendle Witch Trials in 2012, there was a huge art exhibition on Pendle Hill with the date 1612 featured in honor of those women who had died. It's not uncommon that friends today know, or they might have heard, that early Quakers were often accused in similar language as witches, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly. George Fox was accused of being a sorcerer. And Mennonites actually have a similar trend. Other Anabaptists of the same time period or similar time period had a similar thing happening to them. To be a witch was very negative at that time, and it still has some of those connotations today. I've actually heard critics of charismatic Christianity calling it witchcraft because there's kind of this more embodied spirituality. People seem to be in a trance and they might fall over and they might be repeating these prayers that are kind of shifting the atmosphere and whatnot. In the spirit of full disclosure, I'll let you know that I went through a, quote, charismatic phase as a teen. When I was in seminary, I was at Union, and I ended up not going to my local Quaker meeting. I didn't find much spirit there. Like Quaker worship, charismatic worship is a mix of divine presence and human personality. And sometimes visitors have no idea what's going on. I attended First Corinthians Baptist Church with Pastor Michael A. Ralrund in Harlem, which is very much in that kind of Pentecostal, not Pentecostal, but in that kind of charismatic tradition. Over the years, I've experienced a mix of beautiful and troubling things in charismatic worship environments. Quakerism is my spiritual path, but I still appreciate some things about charismatic worship and wonder if friends can benefit from some light experimentation with Pentecostalism. Like, honestly, that's where I learned to preach. I had my coming to the altar moment, and I experienced the movement of the Holy Spirit. That church was the closest thing to Quakerism that wasn't Quakerism that I may have experienced. I found it uh, fascinating looking at George Fox climbing up Pendle Hill and also realizing there's a lot of other spiritual history to that place. What if there is something within Quakerism that is the truth that Quakerism speaks to, is a truth that is in the tradition of Jesus and in the tradition of land-based peoples around the world. Of course, Jesus himself was very much a land-based person. Chad Myers and others have done a lot of work on watershed discipleship. Um, She said it wasn't that long ago that such ecstatic moments of bodily motion were ridiculed as pagan and distinctly non-Quaker. We are a mystical tradition. A spirit can move through us in all of those places. And maybe spirit is asking something different of us now. And so I feel very similarly about my article in that uh, maybe we can consider how the spirit might be inviting us into something new that is actually not very new and enduring traditions that we've kind of cut ourselves off from. You don't have to give up anything about your identity to listen to somebody else. I just led a workshop, a retreat uh, called If Quakers Were Witches at Ben Lemon Quaker Center. I was really surprised at how much response we got. You know, we got a good turnout, but more than that, how many people wrote and were just ecstatic that this was happening. So grateful. And a few people who were like, how dare you? I mean, it actually elicited both responses. It's part of the gift of Quakerism to focus on the spirit uh, rather than rituals, rather than practices and that kind of thing. But it's also part of our limitations that sometimes we spiritualize so much that we forget that kind of embodied and earthy spirituality 
I mean, it sounded like the Wiccan practices and traditions that you were talking about maybe help us connect more to the earth and its rhythms and the natural world. I mean, correct me if I'm misunderstanding, but I think that's part of the uh, things, something that we can learn and recover. Mm. At this moment in time, we're both looking to the past. We're both seeing this need and this, I would say need, to broaden what is considered worship and to deepen into the Holy Spirit in that and to let the Spirit move through us, even if it doesn't look the way we quote unquote think it should look. And what if both of the traditions, the witchy tradition and the Quaker tradition, are listening to something similar. And that today, that there is a listening to the animist, more than human world, in which the Holy Spirit dwells, that has always been within Quakerism and can continue to feed friends and friends of friends. Yeah, I agree. I think there's... That, that common sense of maybe it's time to open to some new fresh winds of the spirit and those might come from surprising places actually as you were talking I was thinking about the story of Pentecost the speaking in different languages the speaking in tongues um, but also part of the miracle was hearing in a way that could be understood and, and hearing the word of God from surprising sources Some people use the language of listening in tongues. Mm, I love the listening in tongues. I, I love that framing. Sometimes our failure to dialogue is an expression of our spiritual insecurity. It's so easy in our world to be caught up in a particular way of listening. That was Sarah Walcott and Andy Stanton Henry. Sarah directs an eco-spiritual ministry. Andy just published a new book that provides insights for local leaders. Learn more about both of them at friendsjournal.org. I encourage you to read their full articles, If Quakers Were Also Witches, and all the way back to George Fox, experimenting with charismatic Quakerism. Visit our show notes at quakerstoday.org for links to their work and for a full transcript of today's show. And if what you heard on today's show has made you curious about where you can find fresh inspiration, you may be interested in a new book by Larita Coleman Brown, What Makes You Come Alive? A Spiritual Walk with Howard Thurman. In his review of the book, Ron Hogan writes, Larita Coleman Brown identifies deeply with the Black American theologian and mystic Howard Thurman. It goes back to when she read his 1949 book, Jesus and the Disinherited. It was a game changer of a spiritual text that offered her a deeper understanding of Jesus's liberating, and transformative spirituality. It also provided a roadmap to a place of psychological and spiritual freedom for everyone. Ron offers high praise for the book. In What Makes You Come Alive, Brown seeks to distill the essence of Thurman's spiritual philosophy for a contemporary audience, and it's a solid effort. You can read the full review and reviews of other excellent new books in the October 2023 issue of Friends Journal, and over at friendsjournal.org. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Quakers Today. Season 2 of Quakers Today is sponsored by American Friends Service Committee. Do you want to challenge unjust systems and promote lasting peace? The American Friends Service Committee, or AFSC, works with communities worldwide to drive social change. Their website features meaningful steps you can take to make a difference. Through their Friends Liaison Program, you can connect your meeting or church with AFSC and their justice campaigns. Find out how you can become a part of AFSC's global community of changemakers. Visit AFSC.org. That's AFSC.org. Visit QuakersToday.org to see our show notes and a full transcript of this episode. Thank you, friend, for listening.
In a moment, you will hear two listeners' strong opinions about the question, when it comes to activism, do the ends justify the means? But first, let me share with you next month's question. Outside of Quaker worship, where do Quakers seek inspiration, spirituality, and community? Outside of Quaker worship, where do Quakers seek inspiration, spirituality, and community? In this episode, you heard about Quakers looking outside the Religious Society of Friends for something more, something that might be missing in Quaker worship. It may be something we once had that is now lost. Some may be seeking new infusions of influences for this time in history. I have often heard Quakers say something like, yeah, I attend Quaker meetings for worship, and I also. Then they tell me about the other faith traditions or spiritual practices. These feed them, center them, or enhance their Quaker faith and practice. So what about you? Outside of Quaker worship, where do Quakers seek inspiration, spirituality, and community? And if you are not a Quaker, outside of your usual spiritual or religious traditions, where do you seek inspiration, spirituality, and community? Leave a voicemail with your name and the town where you live. The number to call is 317-QUAKERS. That's 317-782-5377. 317-QUAKERS. Plus one if you're calling from outside the USA. Now we hear answers to the question, when it comes to activism, do the ends justify the means? The question was inspired by last month's episode, in which we featured the actress Daryl Hannah along with Jeff Walburn. He's part of a mischief-making activist group called the Yes Men. Jeff, not his real name, graduated from Greenwood Friends School, a Quaker elementary and middle school. As a boy, he attended Millville Friends Meeting in central Pennsylvania. Earlier this year, he and fellow activists posed as representatives from the Mattel Corporation. These are the folks who make the Barbie doll. On behalf of the company, they announced it was going plastic-free. Jeff calls these mischief performances that are intended to reveal the truth of what corporations like Mattel are actually doing wrong. So, when it comes to activism, do the ends justify the means? My name is Cap Kaler here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'd like to comment, no matter what anybody says, a lie is still a lie, and contrary to the whole notion of Quaker truth and spirituality. There are some people who lie just to hide the truth, and then there are other people who tell half-lies. Those people who tell half-lies and half-truths have forgotten where they put the truth. This is Glenn from Sunbury, Pennsylvania, leaving a voice memo in response to the question, when it comes to activism, do the ends justify the means? I'm originally from South Africa, and my activist background there was in the anti-apartheid movement. So when I think of this question, I gravitate towards the very difficult debates of my formative years. For example, from a Quaker pacifist point of view, was Nelson Mandela wrong to take up arms against the apartheid government? I'm also haunted by dilemmas such as those dramatized by the recent movie Oppenheimer. If I were a Jewish physicist in the 1940s and had good reason to believe the Nazis were racing to develop nuclear weapons, would I have developed a bomb I knew to be deeply evil, to avert a perhaps even greater evil? So asking this question about a prank press conference about mushroom barbies leaves me a bit dumbfounded. This was an hour-long, witty, non-violent practical joke directed at a huge company polluting the earth with vast quantities of plastic. Are we Quakers really so bothered and confused by a gentle satire that we have to ask? whether the end justifies these means. Voltaire famously admired Quakers, but also caricatured as a humorless, a stereotype that still somewhat persists. I fear that by earnestly asking ourselves such an absurd question, whether saving the earth is worth the moral cost of a gentle satire, we are doing our best to live up to the tricky satire that the likes of Voltaire once directed at us. <laughs> 